guests today because we have uh, Mike Stare with us. So it's true. Mike Fred normally does a dance during the music, and it's this is oh, also true. Don't 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 deprive the listeners on account of me. <laughs> yeah, he, he well he does it as soon as he he knows that when that video is playing for the YouTube people that no one can see it, so he dances and once in a while I'll click it off and out him every once in a while. But he, get, he I'm waiting for him to get up and start dancing one time, and then I'll just off it. I'll cut the video and let everybody see it. You've, you've caught me a few times. Yeah, I should just. Yeah, I should screen record the whole thing, and that way everybody can just see. I can turn it into a GIF, and every time like we celebrate, I'll just the GIF of you dancing. That's good. <laughs> so, so Mike is with us today, and today we're going to be talking about all things spine. So, for anybody who's not familiar with Mike, um, Mike is a fellowship trained physical therapist, physical therapy educator, personal trainer, and nutritionist in the Boston area. He's the owner of Orthopedics Plus Physical Therapy and Spectrum fitness consulting did i get that right again got it nailed oh man i think i have it memorized at this point <laughs> jay you should just be mike's hype man whenever he goes to speak yeah i, I, could, say, I, mean, I need it i need to carry uh, uh, bring you around with me just be i mean i could scream mike is a fellowship trained physical therapist and then <laughs> and we can just like get fireworks going and brad can dance in the background <laughs> oh yeah yeah let's, let's make it happen reminds me well, of a knight's tale what were we gonna auto tune the other day, Brad? We we're gonna auto tune something. Oh, you doing the presidents? You got to oh, yeah. You missed it <laughs> on Monday, Mike. Brad said he could name all the presidents, but he did it in a song. So I said he, if he did the president song again, I was gonna auto tune it for him. And we're the waiting skills for of that. a misspent youth. <laughs> nice, nice. I love it. <laughs> it was. It was. He was trying so hard when he did it not to go in the like the melody for the song too, but you could still hear it. It was. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, it's, like so, the, it's like the ABCs. You can't say it without singing it to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. That's so true. We have to do A B. Yeah. Is that what the tune to ABCs is? Twinkle Twinkle yep. Little Star. Yeah. It really? Is. I never realized that. Brad That's will sing it for you in case. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we can auto tune that. We'll we'll just make a full CD of me auto tuning weird things. Okay, I'll do it. You do you do the uh, present song, and I'll do the alphabet in German, and then we can. Uh, I just oh like my. it says "Ha i Yatka." That's what? my favorite. Ha i Yatka H. Ha oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we so, are now three minutes into the show and have gone completely off the rails. Well, you know, we're building up an audience. Um, so we'll just start. We're gonna be talking about pain. Back pain, neck pain. Um, I mean, Brad, I'm sure sometimes I'm a pain in Brad's ass. Are we talking about ass pain <laughs> as well? No. We're talking about, you are a pain in my neck most of the time, too. Though. Yeah. So that's yeah. Well, <clears throat> for anybody who was not, nobody was in our conversation before the show, Brad, make me, Brad, Brad made me take a personality test. And it told me that I'm a very independent, I'm very independent, but I'm an intensely aggressive, logical problem solver who doesn't like rules. So... <laughs> I, I don't accurate. think a better description of me has ever been read, though. That's true. <laughs> um, so let's get on topic. Sounds good. Low back and neck pain. So <clears throat> do you have anywhere you want to start at, Mike? Or did you? are we just freestyling and coming up with questions? I, I think we can do a little mix of both. Um, I kind of was thinking uh, this morning about some common misconceptions or questions that I'm getting that um, I, I think are really uh, hampering people's abilities to recover from back issues or get the right treatment. So uh, one of the ideas I, I wanted to clarify is uh, a lot of people come to me, especially because my background is in obviously in, in training and fitness, but also uh, as a manual therapist. Uh, that means we do joint mobilization manipulation. So a lot of folks come to me with the expectation that say, you know, my back feels really stiff. So uh, what type of stretches should I do or what type of manual mobilizations should happen? And a huge percentage of the time when people are complaining of back stiffness, um, the problem is actually in terms of what will treat it, uh, the opposite. Um, so a lot of folks are saying my back is stiff. It needs to be manipulated. It needs to be mobilized. I do testing on it and realize they're actually hypermobile. Um, it's actually a stability problem, not a mobility problem. So there was a, a neat research article that came out a few years ago, and they devised this really neat test to measure how stiff people's backs were. 
So people were laying down on a plinth and they had this apparatus that would put a certain amount of force through their spine. So if this is one vertebrae, this is another. It would push down in one vertebrae at a certain amount of force and it would measure how much the vertebrae moved. The more movement, the greater the, uh, the instability or the mobility, they would say. The less movement, the less stability. So they measured that. And then at the same time, they had people fill out a zero to 100 scale about how mobile their backs or how stiff their backs felt. You know, I think zero was like concrete and uh, 100 was, you know, super hyper mobile. They found zero correlation between what the test showed in terms of how much mobility they had and what the people felt. Um, so a lot of times people are feeling stiffness and that might be a reaction of the body to try to protect or to try to uh, stabilize as opposed to a symptom that needs to be treated with aggressive manual therapy and, and massage and stretching. Uh, that explains why a lot of people do a lot of chronic stretching and it's just like a vicious cycle. Their back feels, you know, tight, they stretch, it feels a little bit better, then it gets tight again. So um, that's a, a common thing. If any people out there are, are feeling a lot of back stiffness, it's not a bad idea to get it uh, assessed and don't assume that you need to look on YouTube for the best stretches or the best mobilizations. Uh, a good percentage of the time, that's not the case at all. Huh. That was, I like that. I, I like, I don't even know how to respond. That was the, the, the not needing mobilization thing. And people think they do, I think is, I mean, I've been there thinking I need more, you know, more flexibility and things like that. That's a, yeah, th I mean, that's how I got into the profession. I uh, herniated a, a, a disc pretty badly in my back. I used to work with spinal cord injury patients and lifting them and um, in awkward positions oftentimes. And uh, so I sought out, it was earlier in my career, the most well-known manual therapist in the area. And I was blown away as a relatively knowledgeable professional. Um, what he found on exam was the exact opposite of what I was expecting I needed. Um, but uh, yeah, ever since there's been a lot of research to validate that. So I think that will change a lot of people's expectations about what they should be looking for, especially if they're going to try to help their own back by looking up some resources. Yeah. So do you, is there, <clears throat> I have like 80 questions about back pain. So which is more common lower in, in, from just daily, daily life, uh, lower back pain or neck pain? Um, I would say, I mean, based on what I see mm -hmm. and based on who seeks treatment, um, I would say low back pain is more common. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that means that more people have low back pain. I just think that more people seek treatment for it. Uh, okay. I think neck pain is something that people, uh, live with or less intimidated or scared by, mm -hmm. uh, and seek treatment a little bit less. Um, so I would probably say based on the numbers and what I see, low back pain is more common. Is is neck pain something that is kind of more like acute or or in low in low back pain, something that's more just chronic that builds up over time? Or is it just a mix? I yeah, I think there's a mix, you know, and, and I think it's really difficult to quantify, you know, some people have argued that there's really no such thing as chronic pain, but just repeated episodes of acute you know, um, problems, you know, that it's like an ankle sprain, you know, you sprain your ankle and 10 days later, the swelling goes down you go back to play again and you keep spraining your ankle. Uh, is it a chronic ankle sprain or is it that the original hmm. acute episode never fully healed? Um, so, um, I'm not sure the distinction matters a whole lot other than the fact that when you see people with chronic pain, problems, the treatment usually is a lot different and the expectation is a lot different than acute pain. So um, with chronic pain, you develop uh, hypersensitive neural structures uh, that can transmit pain, even the absence of any known damage. And that really screws with people. Um, so the treatment approach has to be a little bit different if you appreciate that somebody's had pain for a long period of time. Um, mm -hmm. But I think they're equally uh, common. You know, people that wake up one morning and their neck is stiff and they're having a hard time moving, or they did a lift and all of a sudden they get this zing across their back. Um, that's quite common, you know, but also are the people that just go their day-to-day -day life, you know, with uh, significant pain. Yeah. 
So do do you think that the and I don't know if you'll I'm I'm assuming that you're going to know what I'm talking about, but if not, that's your fault. The <laughs> is is the is so is is on Seinfeld is Kramer's technique of cracking a back and making you sleep on a board for a week correct? Um, most of what Kramer has said um, has been correct. So the default answer is yes. <laughs> really? Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, uh, I was going to no. say. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, my philosophy is generally to follow what Kramer has said. Um, no, it is. So, but seriously, are you talking about more about like, you know, you know manipulating <clears throat> the spine when it's painful? Is, is that an, um, a, a good yeah. first reaction? It, it, a, a good a good first reaction or a good long term management solution or is there something better? Yeah, um, the spinal manipulation actually can be quite effective in a certain percentage of the population, um, and it seems like it's mostly uh, temporal too, meaning that there's a certain time frame where if it's going to be effective, it's effective. Um, so there's a a pretty decent clinical prediction rule that physical therapists use to determine, is somebody going to do better, um, worse, or no effect from manipulation? And it's accurate probably about 85% of the time. Uh, what's very important about that is, especially when you're dealing with the neck, if you have symptoms, uh, so you wake up and you have an acute episode of back problems or neck problems, whatever it is. If you have symptoms that radiate down into your arm or symptoms that radiate down into your leg, or you have some sensory issues, your fingers are starting feeling tingly, your reflexes are off in your tricep, uh, that would be a strong indication to stay the heck away from manipulation. Um, it at best will not be effective, at worst it could lead to more problems, um, especially at the neck. Um, the effectiveness also seems to be that if it is going to help with symptoms, um, it usually takes about four episodes of manipulation. So I think one of the biggest crimes in healthcare is that people get manipulated regularly as routine maintenance. Mm -hmm. If you couldn't affect somebody's symptoms reliably within, you know, maybe four or five at most uh, episodes, you didn't, so that's not the problem. Right. So um, I think people are getting fleeced pretty bad when they are told that they need to get it done regularly. Um, so that would be the biggest indication. Are there neural signs? Um, is it a relatively short time period since the onset mm -hmm. of pain? Um, to my knowledge, based on the evidence, chronic manipulation um, is not effective. There is some speculation that it could cause some uh, lengthening or sh stretching of the ligaments and mm -hmm. ironically contribute to instability. Um, the evidence isn't super strong on that. Um, hmm. The risks are minimal. Um, but they're significant. So screening the right person out is critical for that. The second reason to screen the right person is that uh, just to make sure it's going to be effective or not. But this is the biggest problem I see with this that um, is not being addressed, I don't think, in the literature too much or even with just talking with you know people about their pain. It promotes this idea that you are a a, a broken, frailed person needs to be put back into place. Mm -hmm. There is no evidence that we can realign the joints by manipulating. Right. There's, there's, there's actually evidence to the contrary. And if we could, think about how horrible that would be. If yeah. I could put your spine back into place with my hands, you know, a, a sneeze, any, a ball movement is going to put you out of place. Yeah, any so, impact would be done. Exactly. So just think of the how it's perpetuating like your view of your body and how vulnerable you're going to be. Forget ever deadlifting and you know, lifting your kids and you know running if you're that vulnerable. So I, I think that can be a big problem. Um, so when I do manipulate people, because uh, I do, that that's what my fellowship was in, um, I do it probably about a handful of times a year as opposed to a handful of times a day as many other clinicians. Mm -hmm. I explain that there's you know, certain scenarios where it's going to help. And the effect is going to be uh, a relatively modest effect in a short period of time. And other factors are going to play a much bigger factor. Um, I definitely downplay it. There's a lot of mystique and mystery behind it, but um, it's a small piece of a puzzle for a small percentage of the population. Yeah, it just <clears throat> Go ahead, Brad. 
Um, so, and one of the things you brought up earlier that I think was is very interesting, and I think explains at least a lot of the the chronic pain pe- that people have from some initial insult or injury or whatever that kind of lasts forever is kind of this hypersensitization of of nerve fibers. Um, so, a couple questions on that is. I know for a while one of the one of the medical interventions that was occurring for back pain was to basically uh, and I'll probably butcher the exact nerve types, but they were basically providing electrical stimulation through like implanted um, electrodes for like alpha fibers um, mm-hmm. to basically override those uh, hypersensitive pain fibers. Um, so one, I guess the question is there. How effective is that at actually managing the pain? And are there other ways to retrain kind of the the neural piece other than that? Yeah, that, that's uh, based on the gate theory of pain. Essentially, you know, you have A fibers, you know, C fibers, and probably subtypes that are, have been already found since. And the idea is if you could stimulate the fibers that go faster to the brain, yeah. Um, they will essentially crowd out the uh, sensory reception of the uh, of the A fibers. Um, there are you know pros and cons of that theory. To some extent, it is correct. A real general day to day example of that is you smack your elbow and you rub you know your elbow. The idea is that it's a it's a um, almost like overloading the sensory apparatus so that it perceives different uh, sensations more than just the, the nociception from pain. Uh, they're finding that pain, though, is is way more than a nociceptive response, meaning that there's far more than a peripheral nerve uh, stimulation to the sensory cortex that's producing the sensation of pain. Um, there are many modulators uh, from the spine all the way to the brain stem to the cortical areas of the brain that perceive pain. Um, the way I, uh, I explain it, and the reason why I, I think it, uh, this is important for a patient to understand, is if you have hypersensitivity, um, you have to look at the problem as more than, than, than just stimulating nerve fibers or doing uh, electrical stimulation or massage or even mechanical interventions. Um, the, the best way I could explain it is in a real uh, basic analogy. Uh, I call it the guard dog phenomenon. Let's say you have a, uh, a nice estate and it's being guarded by some guard dogs and some assailants come, they breach the security and they ransack your house. You know, what do you think those guard dogs are going to be like the next day when the mailman comes by? You know, they're going to be frothing, ready to attack, mm-hmm. not knowing how to delineate. Is that a normal dude just trying to do its job or is that a, um, a potential, you know, assailant? They're on hypervigilance. Uh, that is based on memory. Uh, there is a phenomenon called neuro tags. You ever, you know, smell something and it evokes an emotion or, yeah. you know, hear a song and it, it evokes this, you know, um, to the similar extent, um, thinking about squats and lifting something up can evoke many of the, uh, the, the actions and the thoughts that are affiliated with pain. Um, your brain takes mechanical information. It takes memory. It takes uh, emotion, um, alertness, context. You know, it will suppress it in certain circumstances. For example, you're saving your daughter out of a you know dangerous issue. You know, you're not really feeling the torn bicep you have from pulling her out of the you know the car. Um, so it can. There are many modulators at different levels of the nervous system that will increase or suppress uh, the nociceptive pain signal. Um, So that type of approach where uh, they've also done ablation, where they've gone to dorsal fibers of the spine and and they, uh, you know, they ablate those nerves um, have not been very successful. And it's not to say that they didn't target the right mechanical or neurological part um, local to the spine. It's that the brain itself can be the output. Um, and one more real quick example about why that's so important is taking extreme examples. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever known anyone who's been an amputee, but 86% of amputees are dealing with something called phantom pain. Mm-hmm. So they have no leg, right? It's from above the knee, it's gone. Most of them will complain of uh, pins and needles, fatigue, burning sensations in a foot that's not even there. So clearly there is no... Uh, mechanical or neurological phenomenon coming from the periphery, but the brain still can perceive uh, pain. 
So we're starting to have a better understanding of that concept. And that is why um, many treatments that would seem very logical um, have not panned out because it's not taking into account other uh, aspects of pain. That that phantom pain, that's the, uh, that interest, I, I think it was one of the first videos I ever like non-cat videos I watched on the internet when the internet first came out and it was the uh it was a uh person uh they were missing they had an arm amputated and they had phantom pain and they were in a mirror box holding a tennis ball and let go and when they did it it was like they said it was instant relief and they got rid of the pain right then yeah so that's that 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 the phantom pain thing is really interesting yeah, and it, it's hard because people swing, I think, too far over to that <clears throat> logic that it's mm -hmm. like Dr. Sarno uh, wrote that book back in the you know late 90s or 2000, you know, pain's all in your head. You can just overwhelm mm -hmm. it. it. It's it's all of the above. You know, it's the nuance that people are having a hard time. There's mechanical parts to this. Mm -hmm. um, there are sociological parts to this. You know, there, you know, societal influences. Mm -hmm. There are psychological influences on it and um, haven't appreciated all those things. That's why getting so focused on the neuroablation, the stimulation factors, the manipulation, um, they have their place and they do work, um, but there are many cases where it doesn't. And I think that biopsychosocial model um, kind of fills in some of the blanks there. Yeah. Brad? Uh, we there do have some questions yep. from listeners. Be before we get to those questions, I just want my biggest takeaway. Well, I took a lot away from that. I like the uh, the the brain aspect of pain is inter interesting. Um, my biggest takeaway, though, is that Brad it will now be called Brad Frothy Dieter, like a dog. So when Brad's angry or ready to get some, I'm just going to ask him if he's feeling frothy. I, I don't, I That's don't think good. I've ever heard a dog described like that, and it's probably my favorite thing in the world. It took <laughs> really? me a second to realize what you're you talking heard about. Of yeah, frothy. I mean, I've heard the word frothy, and I knew what it meant, but it took me a minute to <laughs> figure out there's talking about dog foaming at the mouth. So now, Brad, whenever I text you in the morning, I'm gonna be like, "You feeling frothy today, buddy?" That's one of the symptoms of rabies. Animals yeah. become frothy. Yeah. Now uh, we'll know if you have rabies. Yeah, exactly. When you say yes, I'm feeling frothy and I'm afraid to take a shower, I'll know that it's because you have rabies. That's true. <laughs> All right. Dante said, question regarding exercise and pain. My best friend trains with a barbell, deadlifts and squat. And he says that he gets either acid reflux, low abdominal pain or general dizziness when training with low weight. Um, I think there's a lot of things might be going on there. Yeah. And you know what? Um, that's kind of when I see cases like that, I say, talk to your GP, your general mm -hmm. practitioner. Um, you know, maybe there are some reflux issues. You know, my wife's in, pro in primary care. She, you know, deals with these issues quite a bit. Maybe there's some, you know, type of medication that needs to be on. But, um, you know, intra-abdominal pressure causing, you know, that you know, I mean, could be from a Valsalva, but we see powerlifters doing that all the time without having much of a problem. Um, you know, maybe if there's some blood pressure issues that are undiagnosed, uh, that's something I get a workup on. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to not touch that any further other than just telling you, I think it's probably a good idea to talk to uh, uh, a general uh, practitioner on that. Yep. Agreed. Um, Brad, who's next? Where are we? Paul. Paul said, so would you suggest static stretching before lifting or after? My issue is I have extremely tight hamstrings and go through that described cycle where it's good and bad. Is it just a lack of consistency in stretching? Oh, I love this question. And I get this quite a bit, Paul. So um, the first thing I'd want to do is uh, go through a differential test called a, the slump test. And that's essentially seeing, is this really due to tight hamstrings or is it due to um, maybe some uh, intolerance to what I call dural tension? Uh, the sciatic nerve and the hamstring go in the same pathway. And um, an irritability or tightness of, this, of the dural um, tissues right around the sciatic nerve can replicate sensations of tight hamstring. So here's how I try to do it. I mean, it's a little bit more elaborate in the clinic, but... If you could slouch down and kick your leg straight out in front of you, and by manipulating your head or manipulating your foot, you can alter 
the sensation of tightness, it's a pretty good indication that it's probably not your hamstring uh, because your hamstring has no connection to your spine or to your head, nor to your foot. Um, it's not a perfect uh, delineator, but it's one of them. Um, when a muscle is chronically tight too, muscles are pretty basic. They respond brilliantly to stretch. Um, but if it's chronically tight, I would suspect that um, you'd have to first rule out that there's no uh, you know, underlying spine or sciatic nerve irritation, because uh, that would explain why it would be always tight. You think it's the muscle, but you're stretching the nerve, the nerve gets irritated, the muscle is tightened to try to protect the nerve, and that, thus the vicious cycle. Um, the other circumstance I found is that with tight hamstrings is that a lot of them are tight because they're not used throughout their full range of motion. Um, I guarantee that if you're doing bridges, you're doing hip thrusts, you're doing leg curls, um, but you're not doing stiff leg deadlifts, um, or any type of exercise that works the muscle through a lengthened position, um, it's probably not going to adapt. Uh, I see this happen a lot of times. Um, they strengthen and shorten positions and then they stretch it and they're wondering why it doesn't adapt to more lengthened positions. So, um, after you get ruled out that there's not a sciatic nerve irritation going on, um, I would consider trying to strengthen in more lengthened positions. And I think you'll find that in combination with stretching would work. When to stretch, um, I find um, with moderate weight during um, an exercise, an interset, or with heavy weights or explosive, always do it after. Um, stretching can blunt the uh, reactivity of the muscle for producing power. So it's best in those contexts to do it after. But if you're doing rep effort work, um, I would probably say doing it into your sets. So do a set, stretch, do a set, stretch. One last thing um, I'd encourage you to do, Paul, is that when you stretch the hamstring, one of the biggest errors I see, and this is important if you're going to be doing it in combination with, let's say, you know, doing a deadlift, um, is many people stretch through the spine instead of through the, uh, the, the hamstring. If you look at where the hamstring attaches to, attach it to that hard bone in your butt. You know, if you're sitting on the bleachers and you feel that bone, that's an ischial tuberosity. That's where it attaches to. But if you're bending above at the spine, you'll be taking the slack out above the origin of the muscle. So you might be putting unwanted stress in an area that you don't want to stretch and not enough stress in an area that you do want to stretch. So your back should stay neutral. You should stick your butt out and um, you'll get a more effective stretch without putting some unwanted stress in your spine while you're preparing to lift. So in short, most of the time stretch after, sometimes stretch during. Uh, make sure the stretch is coming from your hip and not coming from your back. But before all that, um, see if you can uh, get someone, get some eyes on you to delineate, is that really a tight hamstring or is it more symptomatic of uh, dural tension? And that would be a different approach. I am glad you did not say anything about lunges because I would have had to cut your mic and turn you off because those are the worst thing. <laughs> man. Nobody loves lunges. <laughs> No, stiff leg deadlifts though are awesome. So that made me happy. Um, question on 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 static stretching, uh, especially since we're talking about before lifting. Is it how important is it to be properly warmed up or have a higher body temperature uh, when you are performing static stretching uh, to reduce the risk of a muscle injury? Um, well, I, I think that would be assuming that there's evidence that static stretching has anything to do with muscle injury. Okay. And the evidence that we have right now is that it's either neutral um, or in some cases might actually be um, correlated with a higher risk of injury. Of um, what, what correlates is, with, I'm sorry, what correlates with a higher risk being cold? Static stretching. Okay. Um, it can correlate with a higher risk. In some studies, it's shown that most of the studies show that there's no correlation, meaning that it doesn't improve and it doesn't harm okay. um, stretching. So um, that being said, I think there are case-by-case -case examples where, and ex especially depending on the task that the person wants to do. So if you're about to jump or sprint versus uh, dance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are going to be, uh, you know, far different contexts. But um, in general, I wouldn't put it on a 
a high priority list of things that would reduce injury. If you are going to stretch, uh, there does seem to be good evidence that doing so um, after having done some active movement is mm -hmm. better. Um, okay. So whether that means higher temperature is required for that, there's a good physiological basis, but not strong evidence on that. Okay. Um, so I would say there's absolutely no risk of stretching after you're already warmed up. Mm -hmm. It's probably a good thing. Anecdotally, uh, people feel much, much better stretching after they've done some active yeah. movement. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was just always, I, I remember it was, it had to be, it was probably like the 2008 version of the NASM manual. It, there was a big thing in there about uh, don't stretch, don't do stre static stretching cold. You should even go into a sauna for 10 minutes to raise your temperature before doing it. So, and then I've never looked into it ever since then. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have a hard time understanding how that would, I mean, I, I think that's more of a systemic temperature raising mm -hmm. versus a local yeah. You know, um, I would say doing bicep curls before stretching your biceps would probably have more local heat if that were to be a physiological mm -hmm. mechanism than sitting in a sauna. But yeah, um, I don't think there's strong evidence one way or the other. Okay. We have uh, one more question kind of on this, the, the back topic. Um, somebody said their post-op from a spinal fusion L5 to S1. What exercises with weights are safe for me now? I'm eight months post-op. That's a wonderful question, and, and it's hard to get too specific for you um, because what's safe for you uh, is contingent on a whole host of different things. I will tell you, though, that recommendations that are given based on poundage um, are usually poor recommendations. Um, we'll hear, unfortunately, from a lot of surgeons uh, that you can't lift anything more than 10 pounds or 20 pounds or whatever, and it's or you know whatever it might be, 30 pounds. Um, I don't like any of those recommendations because it just is completely disregards physics. If you take um, a 10 pound weight and you hold it at the length of your arm, you know, the, the torque is proportionate to the length of your arm and the weight. You know, you take that same uh, weight or double that weight and hold it here, the torque is significantly less. So 20 pounds in many contexts can be safer than 10 pounds. It depends on the on the torque. It depends on the distance you're holding the object. Um, so don't go by arbitrary uh, recommendations by anybody um, that it should be X amount of weight or so. Um, the other thing that it would depend on is how aware you are of, um, of, of your body position. For example, we know that spinal tissues have a lower load tolerance in extremes of motion. So if you're gonna be lifting a light weight, with your spine and a lot of flexion, for example, um, or a light weight or no weight in your spine and a lot of hyperextension. That might be more risky than lifting a moderate weight with your spine in a neutral position. Um, so in order to give you a better answer, I'd have to know more about how you move and the quality of movement. Um, as far as what I typically do with patients is I teach them how to lift with loads uh, with a small moment, uh, meaning that there's uh, a, a small moment arm, the loads are close to them. That usually means they have to have great hip mobility, um, very good motor control of their spine, and excellent endurance to be able to hold those positions. Um, once you pass those tests, then the loading requirements, um, that spinal tissue after eight months um, is relatively well healed. Um, it, some argue that it might take up to 24 months for the tissue to be 100% healed, but part of healing is loading. So I would go by all those factors. So I'm sorry I can't be super specific and tell you, you know, 20 pounds and, and under is fine. <laughs> it's just not how it works. Perfect. Brad, do you have any, before we move on to the next topic, do you have anything? Um, let me comment on? make sure if I don't have any questions. Uh, yeah, so this is maybe more of a selfish question because um, it, it pertains to my own problems. So I've kind of for years had like very, I hate using this word because it's not accurate, but very tight QL muscles. Like they, whenever mm -hmm. like you go get a massage, they just feel like cords. Um, like what are ways that you can kind of address some of those issues? You know, I, I actually, a lot of people, especially clinicians have mixed reviews on, on massage. Um, I think it's, I can think of so few examples where that isn't helpful. Um, 
massage from many, many different perspectives can be a great option. Um, but it does get to the issue as to why is it like that? Yeah. You know, why are they there? Um, the first thing I explore is um, what are what are the day to day habits like? Um, what's the duration of being in prolonged positions? Um, those are usually the, the biggest tells that um, are relatively easy to modify um, and have almost universally positive impacts. Um, so if I can see that somebody sits on average, you know, four to six hours on a five days a week without much interruption, um, that would be a good place to start. The worst thing is that it's going to help them be healthier. The best thing is that maybe that's part of the process feeding in to that hyperreactivity. Um, next thing I look at is, you know, movement patterns. Um, deficits or, uh, of strength in certain areas usually is a reason why another muscle will tend to work harder to compensate. Um, are the, you know, extensors, uh, you know, the endurance of the paravertebrals, you know, weaker than normal? Um, are the, you know, the glutes relatively, and I always say that relative, uh, because many people say I'm strong. Well, you might be strong, but relatively these muscles are weaker or stronger than others. Maybe that's a factor. Technique, of course, with your, your preferred lifts um, is another factor to look at. Um, but that might be the first thing to look into is why is it hyperreactive? Why is it tight? And usually it's because it's protecting for something or compensating for something. The other scenario is that, again, it's working um, without relief. And that might be a postural issue, too. When I mean postural, not what exact position are you in. It's more how long are you in any one position? Hmm. Would bread actually lifting help this? <laughs> I it's hard Sorry, for me also to think of a case where lifting can't help things. But um, you, you know what's interesting though, Brad, is that if if um, that would actually be a good experiment, I find that sometimes the benefit of lifting is that it exposes uh, movement errors or flaws that you wouldn't otherwise see or feel. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you do that anyways. And, but I always find getting another pair of eyes on, on me when I'm lifting or videoing my own lifting, um, maybe it might expose some risk factors to it. Um, but symptomatic wise, I find that, um, that can be very helpful. Interesting enough, also, uh, doing some self traction, um, hanging from a chin up bar, doing deloading while you're sitting. Those are all ways to interrupt the chronicity of, chronic postures that can be irritating. Hmm. I, I expect you to be on our next conference call with grab in one of those, uh, with the boots on where you're hanging upside down. Yo, Dude, those, those inversion tables. Yeah. Those yeah. inversion tables. I don't know if there's any like actual benefit but, to them, but those feel so good. Yeah. But not, not inversion table. I want the bar where you have to hook the boots into it. <laughs> no. <laughs> what right. if I, if I buy you that, will you use it once? Where am I going to hang it on? Right behind you. It's a big stand. You just build a big stand and then you have okay. to jump up there and put your feet up. And I just want to see a video of you doing that. And then, a, like a, and then Marissa running in to help you get down. Okay. But you have to give me like a full back costume so I can like wrap myself up, pretend like I'm sleeping. Yes. <laughs> I'm in. Okay. I'm going on Amazon as soon as we're done with this. Um, so I think all of that leads into our, our next se section that we're going to talk about. And that's deadlifting and squatting with back pain. And this is kind of building off of the uh, the question before Brad's um, on pain when lifting. So is it possible, I'll start us off with my question, is actually we have a question in the group that actually kind of better summarizes what I wanted that talks on this. And this is this is actually from one of our clients, Andrea uh, Ravik Raykov. Andrea Rakoff. Um, and she says, I have lower back pain, but I have it outside the lifting session. I don't feel anything while lifting, no pain at all. How could that be? Yeah, uh, Andrew, that's actually very, very common. Um, and I've had the exact same experience. You know, I was, you know, deadlifting a lot of weight, but my commute to work was killing me. Um, <laughs> sitting, eating dinner was more painful than uh, lifting, you know, 400 pounds. So, um, the reason being is that um, very rarely is pain purely due to a momentary loading of force uh, while you're hyperconscious of your position. 
Um, it's usually more due to uh, chronic exposures to prolonged positions. So um, that is, is a very, very common pattern. So um, uh, you might, the therapist that I originally saw when I had my initial back issue was laughing at me when he asked me what he thought my problem was. And I said, well, I think I have stiffness here and I think I need to get stronger. And he <laughs> looked at me and he goes, you're stronger than probably 98% of the population. Getting more strong isn't the answer. Um, and that explains why a lot of people feel great when they deadlift. When they do types of activities, it's outside of the gym. Uh, there are some therapeutic things from both a psychological and neurophysiological and structural thing when you're lifting. Um, a lot of those things are gone when you're sitting in front of a desk for a while, you're sitting on the floor playing with your kid for a while. Um, when you're doing uh, things that you're not hyper-conscious of or aware of, uh, that could put your spine in, in aggravating and provoking positions. Uh, so the majority of the time when somebody comes to see me that's an active person that's a lifter, the first thing I do is I look outside the gym. And so that's not only a unique case for you, Andrea, that is a very, very common thing. So start um, taking a, a journal and writing down um, scenarios and times where you start noticing your pain a little bit more. Um, Try to see if you can correlate it to, uh, you know, your car, to your work, to habits around the house and the yard. And I bet you're going to find um, that's where those issues are. And then we have to start saying, okay, how are you moving in those contexts? How do we have to modify? Um, perhaps it's your endurance. Perhaps it's your motor control. Perhaps it's just your ergonomics. That's a factor. So super common. I'm glad you asked that because that's one of the points I wanted to get to later. No, I've experienced that too. That's a that's a really good question. Uh, Leanne has a question. She said, any general guidelines for lifting with prior neck and low back injury from a car wreck uh, still causes occasional moderate pain even when not being overly active? Yeah, um, especially with whiplash, um, there is a lot of uh, unfortunate, uh, um, you know, I wouldn't say maybe stereotypes, but uh, at least misinformation about um, the severity of damage and irritability that can occur after uh, whiplash. And um, many times, uh, Gwendolyn Joel, if you want to look her up, J-U-L-L, um, is a wonderful researcher in this topic and has found that um, impairments of uh, the stabilizers, the deep stabilizers, especially the cervical spine, can persist for a long period of time after whiplash mechanism injury of the, of the neck. Um, many times they don't get fully uh, um, resolved, and that's where there can be some persistent problems. Um, so there can be some very specific exercises that are done that can help. Um, being generally active is always a, a great option. And then again, looking for ergonomics, especially at the computer. Um, those are the things that help people a lot with that. Um, the expectation to get back to lifting and perhaps even normal um, lifting um, should be high. Uh, just concurrently make sure you're addressing those other things and don't think because the whiplash happened, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, that there aren't still impairments that should be addressed or resolved. Um, also keep in mind that um, you could be uh, experiencing some chronic nerve hypersensitivity um, that is incredibly common uh, post whiplash after a trauma like that. So um, don't always think there's something mechanically wrong that needs to be manipulated and put back into place, kind of like what we talked about before. Um, you know, less common with the low back because the torque isn't as great during most uh, accidents, but uh, the similar principles would apply. Whiplash is one of those interesting things. When I was a paramedic, we always used to, uh, it was one of the, I went to a class on, uh, I was a vehicle machinery tech, so I was one of the guys who did like the high level extrications as well as being a paramedic. And one of the classes I was in talked about how to uh, like field ways, field signs to uh, note how severe the whiplash was and ways to, you know, relay that information to the emergency department. And one of the things to look for was it's, it was typically easier to identify whiplash signs in females than uh, males because women typically have makeup on. Uh, more often than males. And you could tell, and after I heard that, we started looking for it and you would find lipstick prints on, on women's clothing that would be like down, like on weird spots in their shirt, sometimes all the way down, like mid chest where the hyper, hyper extension came down or hyperflexion. Is that hyperflexion? 
Yeah, uh, hyperflexion. Yeah, 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 hyperflexion yeah. would they? I mean, touch their chest with their lips, or you would see um, things from like if they had makeup on 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 their cheek, you would see it all the way. You would see it all the way back to almost the passenger seat from how far they moved and and the range of movement that they had, or airbags, just hidden random spots in airbags. I don't think people realize how much your neck actually just <clears throat> moves when you get into a fifty mile an hour crash. Before um, this was, uh, there were strong and, and good reasons to have advocacy on um, uh, humane ways of treating animals. They used, they actually, it was a study that was done, I think it was in the late seventies, but they took rhesus monkeys and they essentially replicated a car accident and they oh. dissected them. And they found this, the, the trauma that occurred was, was pretty severe. Um, things that escaped uh, the traditional imaging studies. So not to get you overly you know, consumed on the mechanical damage on that, but uh, also not to um, be surprised that sometimes it can take you know, you know, months and months for healing to occur. And that might explain why there's some residual symptoms. Um, so, um, you know, but you can have great successful outcomes, again, if you look at the resolving those impairments, um, uh, but even if they've been a, a long time ago. Uh, but Gwendolyn Joel is, is a good resource for you to check out, um, and uh, Leanne, and that might be a good uh, reference to start with. Um, otherwise, of course, I'd recommend seeing a, seeing a therapist. I had my mic muted, couldn't fit find the button. Uh, perfect, and we have one more question from Chris. Any tips on recovering from a micro dissectomy at L five S one? Yeah, I, I would actually not be too different from how I would recommend somebody who did not have a micro dissectomy that had some uh, uh, related low back pains. Um, you know, just do bear in mind that one of the biggest things I see from somebody who did versus did not have surgery, even though it's micro. Uh, you still have to invade the paraspinal space, um, and there is there are things that get moved around. Um, I do find that those populations tend to have uh, more um, motor control errors. Um, so a, a real basic example of what I'm talking about, motor control errors. If you've ever sprained your ankle pretty badly, um, and then you healed, so it's been about a month, two months later perhaps, uh, stand on the unaffected foot with your eyes closed and then time yourself and then stand on the affected ankle with your eyes closed. You'll fall over a lot quicker. Your sense of position is a little bit off. Um, whenever you have to have an invasive procedure, even if it's a micro disectomy, I do find that there is a chance that um, the motor control errors are a little bit more extreme compared to somebody who managed them uh, without surgery. So. Um, in those cases, I have a video on this on my website. If you look up, uh, like I think it's a, um, a lumbopelvic position sense, um, a, a pretty unique way that I have people uh, find and identify if they have motor control errors of the lumbar spine. If you have a blood pressure cuff, it can work pretty well. Um, so that would probably be my most unique tip that would be different from how I would address any other case. Um, but treat it the same way. Also, don't think that just because they had a micro disectomy that your disc is back to new. Um, also, don't think that it's going to be perpetually vulnerable. Uh, just realize what got you there. You know, never forget that whenever you have a surgery, the idea isn't just to fix the structure. The idea really should be why did the structure get damaged? What were the vulnerabilities before? What were the things that happened? Because it could be like taking Tylenol for a headache and then smack your head against the wall. Wonder why the town hall didn't work. You, know, you gotta look back into what might have been feeding the problem and then address that and then, so don't don't forget about that stuff just because you had a successful microdisectomy. Otherwise, Chris, you should be uh, good to go. Um, just keep up with the general principles of treating backs healthy and I think you'll be fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Mike. Brad, do you have anything that you want to comment on, ask questions or sing about in a, tune about the presidents did you have a song about the vice president or the states um no but i could probably list all the states um so one of the things that was a big uh kind of a, a long um back pain um probably for i'm trying to think most of the 2010 to 2016 
era was um, Kelly Sturette's kind of approach to, um, you know, addressing movement patterns and pain and things like that. Um, I'm just curious your perspective on some of those, some of those modalities um, and the ways of addressing movement patterns and pain. You know, uh, I, I think movement, even when it's uh, from Pilates, from, you know, yoga, from strengthening, um, has always, and I want to emphasize this point because I think people get very territorial around the whole idea of movement and back pain, um, has always tended to move in a, in a positive direction, always tended to help people. Yeah. Uh, when you compare Pilates to core strengthening programs to general strengthening programs, uh, the problem is it's not moving. So I want to get, I want to start with that. Uh, as far as Kelly's uh, approach, um, what I would take issue with is this very hyper mechanical idea that everything needs to have, um, everything is due to mobility or everything's due to um, uh, a soft tissue problem that you need to kind of mobilize and beat it out of you. Um, I don't think that's if you talk to Kelly and I've heard him explain a little bit more in depth, I think he has a far more eclectic picture of it. But I do think the interpretations of his work is that I need a lacrosse ball and a massage thing and every single part of my body needs to be discreetly mobilized in order to, to work you know, properly. Um, I think I see a lot of people interpreting that way. So I would be a little cautious to say that, you know, my QLs need to be dug into with someone's fist in order to calm down. And I need to get, you know, a foam roller deep into my psoas in order to release my glutes to have better activation. Um, I think it's a quite of a simplistic idea. And I also find it to be um, not um, uh, surprising that it's mostly like a 20, 30 some crowd that tends to use that. Um, for me, the way to really see if something's working or not is find a car wreck patient, someone who's just doing really horrible and they're 40 or 50 and are not in great shape. Um, try to mobilize the heck out of them and do a lot of soft tissue work on them and they're not going to get a whole lot better. So um, I think there's a lot of pros to getting people moving and taking active control on how their body moves. Um, I just think people are going to dis be disappointed if they think it's all about um mobilizing this and stretching the soft tissue here. I think it's, that's a little too simplistic. Sweet. Oh, sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things where, um, I think it was, it was very kind of at the time, I think it was very important that people at least kind of started to think about movement quality i think that was one of the really good things that his work did at a pretty big scale is right like if especially if you're doing crossfit six days a week and you're doing all this stuff it's um if you're not watching your movement quality just pouring more volume on it's probably not a good thing um and i think it definitely made people hyper vigilant of some of that stuff um, I, I, yeah i think so but i think it also gave people the idea that you can keep throwing weights around over your head, you know, at yeah. <laughs> you know, high volumes at high speeds after you just ran three miles and did inverted sit-ups. And that as long as you just do all these mobilizations, you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, so you're right. I think it did a lot to, if, as, if you're a physical therapist or a, an educated fitness professional, you could take what he said and apply it to your unique context. If you're not, I think it's just, I, I think it can be, it can backfire. Yeah, I think when you give you tell people that this is the solution to all your problems and it's not, I think people uh, mm -hmm. they they do more than they otherwise would um, and can cause more problems. I agree, hundred percent. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to discuss today besides Brad's awesome sport coat? <laughs> today you're wearing one. I know. I had to show up for Mike. <laughs> oh, when it's me, you don't have to care. You don't even you don't even get dressed up for me anymore, Brad. This We're is at that not... point in our relationship. Jim. Yeah, our, I don't even show up to date night dressed. Yeah, up no, anymore. this is. <laughs> I don't even. I don't get haircuts for you anymore. You don't put dress nice for me anymore. No, this is ridiculous. I'm glad we... I'm spicing up the relationship here, guys. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. We need a. We need a. We need to take a break, Brad. We're at the. We go out to dinner and just spend the whole time on our phones phase of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I can never let myself ever get there. So we will not be there. <clears throat> we, but we can definitely tell each other we were on a break. That's true. 
Did you see David Schwimmer actually address that in like a like what his thoughts on the Rachel Ross break were recently? No, I have not. He said, I, you know he, what? I don't spend much of my uh, limited free time worrying about what happened on Friends 15 years ago. <laughs> wow. That wow. was a that was wow. a jab to the ribs <laughs> there. Sorry, Brad. Uh, some of us some of us actually watched the morning news while we work. I can't it was on it. it was on the morning news and David Schwimmer said they were on a break. I think and my brain's fun. been so scattered by modern technology that like I have I can't have anything on in my office when I'm working. Like no TV, no Pandora, nothing. I have to like turn my email notifications off. It's just I get too uh, distracted. So if I if I get up early, <clears throat> like when I get up at like 4 30, if I don't have background noise on, if I'm at 4 30 and working from home, if I don't have background noise, I'll fall asleep in my chair. So I have to have some background noise on to keep from just <laughs> dozing off. I think that just means you need more sleep. Well, if you're the one who's yelling at me that I'm taking some free time to to do something, so I might yeah, I don't know how I'm supposed to get more sleep when I'm I'm not uh, allowed to enjoy pop culture anymore. Touche. Um, let's see. We had one. I'm tired to do the show, but what about sciatic pain? Um, Renat, make a post in the group with your question, and we will get to it. Um, somebody will get to it shortly. So, Mike, people are looking for you. Uh, to get in contact with you, they can go on over to spectrumfit.net. Is that correct still? It is. All right, look at that. I even have that saved so I don't have to retype it every time anymore. Nice. I'm so proficient now because I'm... Brad, this is what I do when I'm watching my pop culture news in the mornings. I expect a... Uh, in our meeting on Friday, Jay, I expect a full report of what David Schwimmer said about the Ross... No, you don't get to know anymore. I, that's what I'm gonna. That I'm gonna well, put on the agenda. Well, then your agenda is gonna be unanswered. We're <laughs> in a we're in a fight, and you have to send me flowers. We're on so, a break. <laughs> yeah. And dress up next time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I might even get a haircut for you, Brad. That would be swell. Wow, you are just firing shots at me. You are annoyed with me today. <laughs> you know what, Brad? You're just putting on a silver platter for me, and I just keep taking them. Well, Brad, remember, I'm a I'm a very independent but intensely uh, intensely aggressive logical problem solver who doesn't like rules. So that's per your test. So don't don't be mean. All right, Mike. Thank you for listening to our uh, marital spat here. And uh, again, you guys can visit Mike at spectrumfit.net. That's S P E C T R U M F I T.net. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. And we will uh, see you again in, in two weeks again. Yeah, sounds good. We're going to talk about then. Not, okay. not pop culture stuff because Brad will have an aneurysm. <laughs> I mean, that's true. I probably will. All right, guys, if you have any questions for Mike, um, you can either um, head over to spectrumfit.net or post them in the group, and then we can ask him for our, uh, our show in two weeks. All right, everybody have a good one, and we will see you later.